Hey guys and welcome to episode 6. Today we have a pretty massive episode with Epic, plenty of layoffs across the game industry and of course a good preview of Lords of the Fallen coming out on the 13th of October. So let's jump straight into it. So it's official, Epic Games is being held accountable for loot box schemes and has decided to settle and pay out $2.75 million in Canada, which is pittance to a company such as Epic. The creators of Fortnite, Rocket League and more. And if I need remind of our previous episode, Reunity, that Epic also own the Unreal 5 engine. If you missed that episode, feel free to check the title card right above right now. The payments started going out as recently as Thursday, September 28th, after the Supreme Court of British Columbia recently presided over the class action lawsuit against Epic Games. It was determined a breach of consumer protection laws occurred regarding the purchase of loot boxes. The main focus of this lawsuit was where the loot boxes could be digitally purchased without requiring consent from the card holder, meaning children could make these purchases resulting in thousands in debt. While this class action lawsuit only resulted in a settlement and not a liability of wrongdoing on Epic Games part, this will set precedent for future national and international legal proceedings and taboos surrounding loot boxes and online gambling that are becoming common as of late. Like I mentioned in last week's episode with EA Soccer FC and their nefarious loot box practices. Click here on the title card to watch that episode after this. Canadians are now eligible to apply for their portion of the class action lawsuit, which gives them up to $25 per claimant. Yay, we're rich guys. So while people are getting pittance in return for this settlement, its main intention is to deter future issues. Earlier in the business day of Monday, October 2nd, Director of Production at Epic Games, Sergei Galiokin, announced he would be stepping down effective as close of business that day. He cited reason for leaving this position was he felt he was not a good fit for where Epic was headed as a company. His reference to the direction of the company was to the new company vision plan and Epic 5.0. Galiokin has also stated he will remain in the gaming industry in a hope to be a more vocal voice now that I don't have to worry about the PR department knocking on my DMs. Sounds a little salty to me. While he has stated his reason for leaving being due to creative differences, many suspected directors move to be driven by Epic Games' decision to lay off 16% of its total workforce, or roughly 830 employees, and or recent pending legal action taken against Epic for its loot boxes and microtransactions in several nations. Needless to say, there has been a lot of drama coming out of Epic Games in the last two weeks, and likely it isn't over. Remember when I said it isn't over yet? Yeah, Epic are laying off 16% of their total staff, which equates to approximately 830 employees, in case I need to say it again. Last week, an internal email from Epic's CEO, Tim Sweeney, was leaked to the public. While the majority of these layoffs will not affect departments such as Fortnite and the Unreal Engine teams, there has been word from people on production teams for games such as Fall Guys and smaller studios like Mediatonic, mentioning that they were already feeling the effects of the layoffs. In the email memo to the company, Sweeney stated, For a while now, we've been spending more money than we earn, and went on to say, I have been long enthusiastic that we could power through this transition without layoffs, but in retrospect, I see this was unrealistic. And closed off with, we concluded layoffs are the only way and that doing them now and at this scale will stabilize our finances. At least on the flip side, they're providing them with severance pay and healthcare. While Epic is the most recent company to make news for mass layoffs and post-pandemic reduction to staff, they are certainly not alone in having to take actions to strengthen their finances and the future of their company. Embracer Group spent the last few years acquiring studios and due to financial worries is now in the firing range or axing positions such as a few months ago with Volition Studios. Just over two weeks ago, they removed and cut positions at 
Bean Dog, responsible for Baldur's Gate 1 and 2 Enhanced Editions. This week they sacked 10 people from Crystal Dynamics, creators of the latest Tomb Raider games, and they confirmed more job cuts on the horizon. They're even trying to sell off Gearbox Studios, which they only bought two years ago for 1.3 billion. Microsoft confirmed that the start of the year to lay off roughly 10,000 employees with additional up to 300 in July. CD Projekt Red announced in July plans to lay off some 10% of their staff. Team 17, primarily known for the game Worms, announced this week they are restructuring as their CEO is stepping down and over 50 people will lose their jobs, mostly in quality assurance. Speaking of quality assurance, Naughty Dog, creators of hits like Uncharted, Crash Bandicoot and The Last of Us, announced they are planning on cutting up to 25 jobs across several sectors of contract workers, but primarily focused on QA with no severance offered as reported by Kotaku. Other production and developer companies that have announced major layoffs in 2023 are Unity, Riot, Blizzard Games and Bioware to name only a few, but let's go through more in the last few days alone. Sega is expected to let go people involved in the upcoming game called Hyenas, which after multiple closed betas had the plug pulled resulting in one game which will never see the light of day, citing that they do not see profitability in this game's future. And today Telltale Games had to lay off a number of employees due to market conditions. They would have made games such as Tales of Monkey Island and A Wolf Among Us. So lots of layoffs unfortunately for developers and QA. I really hope that all these promising developers will find a new home and make fantastic games into the future. From developer layoffs to retirement, the news was broken by Jason Schreier of Bloomberg, who has contacts everywhere. Sony announced it soon afterwards, with the man himself issued a statement where he announced his retirement. It comes as a bit of a shock as he only served as president and CEO of Sony for five years, and usually people in such positions aim to keep hold of that title for a lot longer. He announced his retirement after nearly 30 years at the company, stating he found it increasingly difficult between his job in the US and work-life balance at home in the UK. He will continue his role until March next year, where Hiroki Totoki will be appointed as an interim CEO. His departure, as stated, is a bit of a shock after only five years as top dog. We can only ask why. It would make more sense if PlayStation was struggling, which quite frankly, it is not. It is still leaps and bounds over Xbox in sales, for example. And it has had, and still is producing, critically acclaimed titles. He had no major dramas or such forcing him to vacate outside of a not very good stage presence or the fact he was not a gamer and some odd comments which could be seen as mildly controversial or even medical concerns to note so maybe there is no need for speculation and he is simply ready to relax for the remainder of his years with his family or could it be that playstation felt he did not do a good enough job to stop the microsoft acquisition of activision blizzard i wish him the best of luck in his retirement Lords of the Fallen is coming on October 13th, another Souls-like game to hit the genre. But this is not the first attempt of the Lords of Fallen. You see, Lords of Fallen was originally slated as Lords of the Fallen 2. However, after development began, the people involved quickly realised this was more of a reboot rather than a sequel, after the first Lords of the Fallen met abysmal reviews and they took those criticisms on board to help in this creation of the rebooted Lords of the Fallen. I can only imagine that they're going to try and make this a franchise just like Dark Souls 1, 2 and 3. Caesar Vertosu, creator director, has stated, how we started was working on Lords of the Fallen 2. After working on it for quite a long time, we basically realized that what we were doing was a reboot. If you play the first game, you will feel a familiarity with the lore. But if you're new to the franchise, you will feel at home anyway. Unlike its previous incarnation, which was often called too rigid by players, the new game is said to provide many classes and combat styles to allow for versatile gameplay and provides a large selection of both ranged and melee weapons for your character to use. 
The combat of the game is described as fast-paced and feels very fluid with a great transition between offensive and defensive battle tactics. While the game is still described as extremely tough, it sounds as though developers considered latency between prompting a player to block and the character blocking the attack. This is something that could definitely have been felt in Lies of P, which uses a very similar blocking system like this game does, whereby when you block, you will still take a bit of damage, but you can regain that damage back if you don't take a direct attack in the meantime. Where Lies of P, I felt, was a little bit too unfair, is that the time it took to get a perfect block could have been given a little bit of extra leniency, even just a 0.5 of a second, just to help newer players and people struggling with the system. The game features hauntingly beautiful scenery, one would expect from a Souls type game, with a mix between dark, unwelcoming looking locations surrounded by breathtaking landscapes, and makes excellent use of lighting effects to texturalize and complete the setting. The most unique and highly anticipated feature is the world system. Described by the creative director as completely connected through shortcuts, hidden paths and more, it's metal as hell full of dark catacombs and terrifying gothic cathedrals that ooze atmosphere, but it's also sometimes bright, revealing a beautiful landscape. Umbral, the land of the dead and foundation of the Lord of Fallen, is essentially Axiom, which is the land of the living super edgy and evil eldritch horror twin. A world that reflects the world of the living, but far spookier and overgrown with gnarled root and branches. How the two world systems work is that Axiom is the main world you're adventuring and can freely travel around as you explore more and more areas. However, when you die, the Lords of the Fallen will always bring you to the Umbral, where you must then defeat enemies, blocking your access to return back to Axiom. Additionally, the two world mechanic will act as a puzzle solving feature where players can use their umbral lamp while in Axiom, which illuminates those sections of the map in Umbral. Once illuminated, you can explore Umbral to get around various obstacles that may stand in your way in Axiom. For example, a chest behind a wall, in Axiom you go to Umbral and the wall is gone, so you can pass through, then teleport back to Axiom by using the lamp on the other side, that kind of thing. The lamp has secondary features as well that will allow you to interact with breakable barriers, summon platforms, and even in elements of combat as damaging multiplier without being too OP or taking from the difficulty expected from a Souls type game. There's three types of magic in the game. Umbral, which is your typical dark magic, Inferno, which is your fire magic, and Radiant, which is typically your miracles that you would see in Souls games. Similar to Souls games, you gain currency called Vigor, which will help you level up and upgrade your stats and buy items. Vestiges are your checkpoints, which are signified as previous lamp bearers who fell along the way. You can level up and fast travel from these points as well. Interestingly enough, in this game, you can get vestige seeds, which you can place in flower beds scattered throughout your journey, where you can rest at if you're too far away from a vestige which once again are your checkpoints. You get very limited amounts of these seeds and you never truly know how long it is until your next Vesiege safe point is, so it adds to the tension of whether you should use these or not. NPCs are cryptic with their own stories and quests and can join you at your main hub and even aid you in boss fights. Boss fights are described as challenging as one would expect from a Souls-like game and obviously will vary in difficulty, but we will see how the final polish will be after release. I most likely will end up streaming this, so check out my Twitch streams, typically Monday, Wednesday and Sunday. Link will be on screen in the description box below, under the like and subscribe button. From Turn 10 Studios comes a series of simulation racing games seeking to emulate the performance of what it's like in the life from production to racing. Essentially, it's the rival to PlayStation's Gran Turismo. Forza Motorsport spins its way to Xbox and PC on October 10th. Little Gator was developed by Playtonic Games and is a 3D platformer. Embark on an adorable adventure, discover new friends and uncover everything the island has to offer. Climb, swim, glide and slide your way into the hearts of many different characters you meet. Little Gator swims its way from its PC origins to all consoles, bar the Switch, on October 10th. 
Roblox, the online sensation most popular amongst kids and teens is coming to PlayStation 4. It is an online game platform and creation system where users can program and play games created by others. Roblox creates a new home for itself on PlayStation 4, October 10th. It's time to play your cards with Wild Card Football by Sabre Interactive. Create your dream team from hundreds of pros in a 7 on 7 challenge. Use cards to summon special moves like invisibility or blocking with a wall. Football meets wild fun. Get ready to score with Wild Card Football to PC and all consoles October 10th. Honkai Star Rail released earlier this year by the creators of Genshin Impact, MiHoYo. It is a RPG gacha game based in turn-based combat with elements of open world and dungeon crawling with systems carried over from Genshin Impact. Honkai is ready to empty your wallets with its PlayStation port October 11th. Total War Pharaoh is a turn-based real-time strategy game developed by Creative Assembly Sophia. As part of the Total War series, this entry is set in the New Kingdom of Egypt. Choosing from eight leaders across three factions, the game world becomes progressively more dangerous. Take your turn with Total War Pharaoh, only on PC on October 11th. The Front by Samar Studio is a survival open world crafting shooter. As a resistance fighter, you are sent back in time to stop the rise of an empire. Fight off hordes of monsters, build shelters, craft tech, all while balancing resources. Prepare your survival with The Front, launching only on PC October 11. Haunted House by Orbit Studio is a roguelike reimagining of the classic Atari adventure, where you explore and descend into the depths of a haunted house to discover secrets, tombs, towers and catacombs in your grandfather's footsteps, all while tackling new enemies. Prepare to be spooked with Haunted House coming to PC and all consoles October 12th. And finally on our long list we come to Transformers Earthspark Expedition developed by Tessera Studios. It's the first game of the Earthspark franchise where you battle and explore the world in search of ancient technology as Bumblebee before the antagonist of the game can. A big array of familiar characters will appear in the action adventure. Autobots transform and roll out on PC and all consoles October 13th. And that's the show. Thank you so much for watching today, guys. I know I didn't appear on camera much for this episode, but there was so much to get through, so I, I hope you don't mind. Anyway, outside of that, make sure to check out my lovely Twitch streams for future gameplay Monday, Wednesday, and Sundays, as mentioned in the Lords of the Fallen section. If you want to check out more, also check out my lovely Discord. Check out our previous videos on our YouTube. And if you did like this episode, please, of course, feel free to check out that lovely like button and subscribe button down below. And consider even helping out on our Patreon to support the future creation of these videos as well. Other than that, guys, I hope you enjoyed this big episode. But until next time, I hope to see you very soon. Stay safe, take care of yourself, and schlongia. Thank you.